Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and sent him away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved to pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber. He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. First of all, good morning, UBC. I just want to thank Reverend Natalie for this opportunity to speak here this morning um, and have this time with you all. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. You are my strength and my redeemer. I ask that I may decrease and you might increase, O Lord. You are my strength. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my sermon is Do This and Live, or Who Have You Met on the Roads and Highways of Your Life? This morning's sacred text is a well-known parable about the Good Samaritan. I'm sure most of us have heard many sermons about this text. We look at the portrayal of the characters in this parable, and there have been many characterizations of this priest and this Levite. There have been many that have surmised and various explanations abound as to why they chose to walk on by and not provide any care to this wounded man as he lay beaten and near death. Jesus did not provide a reason in this parable. Among the explanations that I have heard about this priest and Levite's behavior may have been due to the fear of becoming ritually unclean and unable to perform their liturgical duties if the man was dead. However, it has been noted that according to Jewish ritual, the priest and Levite's responsibility was to save the man's life. It overrailed every other concern, including keeping the Sabbath. If the man was already dead, their responsibility was to bury the man. I think perhaps it was just plain old fear. Sometimes we see things happen and we struggle with, shall I get involved? What is the personal cost if I get involved with this? So maybe they thought, I'm just gonna 
pray and press on. Every time I read this text, something new emerges for me. I look at it at a different perspective. It becomes new. Looking again at the text, I, I want to look at the lawyer's question. The lawyer asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, okay, what's written in the law? What do you read there? And he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Okay, that's the right answer. And this is what I see in my mind's eye. I envision the lawyer thinking, okay, this Lord thing, I can love the Lord. That's easy, 100%, I got that. But this neighbor stuff, Okay, and wanting to justify himself. And that word justify, what does that mean? To justify yourself before Jesus. Justify to appear righteous. Is he trying to make himself look good before Jesus? Justify, did he really want to know? Is this a diversionary tactic? The lawyer was rightfully concerned with eternal life, but I'm not sure about this neighbor thing. I'm not sure about that part. I'm gonna need a little bit more information about what this entails. After all, my neighbor is not like me. My neighbor doesn't look like me. My neighbor doesn't think the way I do. My neighbor doesn't vote the way I do. My neighbor doesn't even like the same foods I like. What am I supposed to do with that? What am I supposed to think about that? We sometimes look warily at our neighbors. We right now are in volatile times where there can be a sense of distrust, a sense of judgment, a sense of othering. Love your neighbor but speak to injustice. Love your neighbor, speak to oppression. Love your neighbor, speak to human rights atrocity. Love your neighbor, speak to brutality. We learn more about each other. We can find the God in others, which leads to finding the God in ourselves. You know, when I was younger, I used to do wild, crazy cross-country trips by myself, which were sometimes ill-advised. <laughs> and one time I found myself on this road, a back road, it was dark, just off the highway, and I ended up with this blowout on my tire. And it was kind of crazy, it was dark, it was raining, it was just at dusk, it wasn't quite dark. And it was a blowout and then I realized the next service station, gas station, convenient mark was like 50 miles away. And this was, yes, pre-cell phone days. So I couldn't pick up my phone and call AAA and say, hey, can somebody come and help me? Next thing I know, I looked up through the driving, pouring down rain and a person started walking toward my car. It was a man probably around 6'4", big, muscular guy walking toward my car, and I was like, okay, this can either be good or bad. I'm not sure which. <laughs> and he looked up and said, oh, ma'am, look like you got some problems there. And my tire was pretty well shredded, and he said, you got a spare? And I said, well, uh, yeah, I got a spare. He said, oh, I can change that thing for you in no time. And I realized that I had seen him throughout my travels. We kept passing each other. And he kind of looked in, he said, oh, you don't, need to be, you, don't, you don't need to get out of the car or anything. I got this, just pop the trunk, I got this for you. That man was my good Samaritan. I wasn't quite like the man in the story here. I wasn't beaten, I wasn't robbed, but he saw me in need of some help. He didn't pass me by. I'd seen some other cars, they 
looked and kept going. But this man was my good Samaritan in this situation. And I was very thankful that he saw my need and pulled over. So it could have been insignificant, but to me in this situation, it was a very significant event. I thought, yeah, I don't know what I'm gonna do. But to me, an insignificant event to one person can be very significant when you're the person in need. So I was very thankful for him, offered to pay him for his troubles. He said, you don't need to worry about that. It's, I'm glad I could do it. My point to that is any little event or time that we can help a person in trouble might seem insignificant. But to the person that you're helping, it can be a huge deal to them. And as we refer back to our text, I look at how Jesus answered the lawyer. He never answered him directly when he asked him who his neighbor was. Jesus just said, there was a man. He didn't tell you anything about the man. He just said, there was a man. As he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And what was interesting to me about the story, Jesus made the Samaritan the hero in the parable. Now, Samaritans didn't really get a lot of good feeling in the Bible stories that you read. You know, Samaritan in this parable, he was the one that tended the man, bandaged his wounds, secured lodging, and cared for him while he continued on his journey with promises to return and pay for further expenses. Now let me tell you a little bit of background about the Samaritans, but a little disclaimer here. I'm a second year seminarian on a beginning journey of discovery with Christian history, theology, world religion, with an attempt to present just a snippet of information about the Samaritans. That's also a tongue twister. Seminarian, Samaritan, now say that fast three times, okay? <laughs> During Jesus' ministry, he had contact with the Samaritans. They were half Jew, half Gentile, and they were said to come from a race of people at the, after the Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 BC. Certain people from the north nation of Israel stayed behind. These people intermarried with the Assyrians, producing the Samaritans. The Samaritans had no dealings with the Jews and vice versa, and they rejected Jesus. But Jesus' ministry was one of radical hospitality, of openness, and invitation to many whom the surrounding cultures and religions held to be inferior or immortal. Now, Jesus didn't condemn them. Jesus welcomed them. Jesus ate with them. He welcomed them into community because that's what Jesus does. Jesus calls us to love. In John 13, 34, in the moment just before Jesus knew that Judas would go to betray him, Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You should love one another. But you know how it is, we make love so complicated. It says again in John 15, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And Jesus says repeatedly, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. This love thing must be pretty important because Jesus says it repeatedly. The commandment to love your neighbor as yourself in John 5, 12, to love one another as Jesus has loved you is reminiscent of this sacrament of communion. If we love Jesus, we can do so 
in memory of Jesus, the embodiment of Christ in the world. Because we are remembering Christ by loving Christ as he has loved us and continues to love us. Do this and live. Do this in remembrance of Jesus, the embodiment of Christ in the world. For as in, in Ephesians 2.10, it informs us we are Christ's workmanship in, re, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance, in advance for us to do. It's no surprise. It's no secret. God prepared it ahead of time. And as I end with a prophet, not in a theological sense, but a musical one. Love is in need of love today. Don't delay. Send yours in right away. Hate, hate is going around. It's breaking many hearts. Stop it, please, before it's gone too far. Amen. Yeah.